We are on the doorstep of the Festival of Shavuos. Of course, the Festival of Shavuos, it comes 50 days after, after Pesach, and it marks, it commemorates, we relive the Sinai revelation. It was only a few weeks after the Exodus. The nation coalesces around the mountain, and they have the most memorable, transformational, noteworthy experience ever experienced by any people, by any nation. Of course, it's important to read the book, not just to watch the movie, because the movie depicts it as if Moshe was on the mountain by himself, accepting the Ten Commandments from God, and that's not what happened. Read the book. The book is very clear that the entire nation witnessed prophecy, something that never happened before, never happened again. No one ever even claimed that this happened any other time. An entire nation was temporarily catapulted, elevated to level of prophecy. And they hear the Almighty, and they hear the Almighty speaking to Moshe. We tap in, we listen to this conversation between the Almighty and Moshe. We become prophets, and we live to tell the tale. This is one of the most incredible events, maybe the most transformational and consequential events in all of human history. And it happened to our people, and we relive it year after year, but really every day. You know, this is what we do. Our nation, we receive the Torah. We started to receive the Torah. We got the Ten Commandments. We got the mitzvot. Moshe went up to heaven for 40 days to get the actual details. The Ten Commandments are a digest, are a concentrated version of all of Torah. Our status tells us that there are 613 letters in the Ten Commandments because they contain really everything in a very concentrated form. Moshe goes up to heaven for 40 days and 40 nights, doesn't eat, doesn't drink. And he receives the details. And the Almighty gives him the tablets which are etched by the finger of God. And this he brings down, of course, doesn't really end so well because he comes down, he finds the golden calf and the revelry and he shatters the tablets and he goes up a second time, it goes up a third time and comes back down on Yom Kippur with the second set of tablets. But the initial beginning of the Jewish people's forging of a permanent bond with our creator was done on Shavuos. We experienced the prophecy, we heard the Ten Commandments, the first two from Hashem directly, and the subsequent eight via uh, via Moshe as well. And this is when it all started. This is where our nation was essentially founded. And every Shavuos, we relive it and re-experience it and re-accept the Torah anew. So to celebrate this and to deepen our appreciation of this festival, we gathered together with uh, the, the Torch rabbis and podcasters here in the Torch Center and we're going to discuss it. And like uh, we've done in the past, this is going to be the Torch Roundtable, the Torch Podcasters Roundtable. And we're going to talk about the festival. And uh, we haven't coordinated what we're going to talk about. We haven't uh, made plans. This is just, we're going to, we're just, we're just, we're just going to chat about it, talk about the festival. And everyone's going to have the opportunity to talk about uh, the ideas and the themes and insights. Everyone's going to share something about the festival. And we have, of course, Rabbi Yaakov Nagel, who is uh, one of the OGs, has been here at Torch for a very long time, since 1998, when I was 12 years old. Rabbi Nagel was in Houston, Texas, overseeing, orchestrating the transformation of the city and of the state. And he's here with us. We have Rabbi Ari Wolby, has been here since 2005. Rabbi Busto, I think you came in 19? That's right. 2019, and Dan, who's been uh, on the board for, well, I don't remember what that was. What was that, 2015 or something like that? A long sure. time before he resigned from the board, uh, much to our displeasure. But uh, he's still part of the team here, still uh, a great fighter for the cause, and of course has a wonderful podcast. He's with us as well. It's great to have all of y'all here. So let's begin. We'll start with Rabbi Nagel. Oh, oh, yes, and me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Yaakov Wolby. I've been a torch since uh, 2012. Crazy to think about. It's been I'm in my 12th year here, uh, and uh, yeah, so I'm I'm here. And thank you for for reminding me about that. Uh, but let's begin with uh, Rabbi Nagel, the most senior uh, representative here. Uh, Rabbi Nagel has an incredible Dafyomi podcast. I encourage everyone to listen to it. Uh, he's also um, instrumental in the community as uh, the rub of one of the shuls. Gives the Daf Yomi here, involved in all sorts of ways of advancing the cause of the community in ways that people know of and ways that people don't know of. Rabbi Nagel, let's hear what we have to say on Shavuos. 
Okay, you actually alluded to uh, one of the questions that bother me about Shavuos, and uh, you know, from a question you can really tease out and draw out some fascinating insights into the into the Yom Tov, into the holiday. So, the question is, is that when you think about the event as seminal as it was, the event that took place on Shavuos itself, it uh, was very short lived in in terms of the fact that the the tablets that Moshe brought down ended up becoming like as he was bringing them down they you know he saw them involved in idolatry and he just had to break those uh tablets and destroy them and he had to start over again and it's like kind of like really strange that uh we make a big deal about this holiday and the receiving of the ten commandments when um we we certainly haven't held up i guess um, and that's it's just something to think about a little bit. Like, what's what's going on over here? It gets a little more interesting when you think about a few other questions related to Shavuos. I think it all ties together. So another thing is the name of the holiday is unusual. It's called the Festival of Weeks. Shavuot is a week. It's, and it's the Festival of Weeks because there's seven weeks preparation for the holiday. And it's strange. We're not commemorating the holiday, it's the, the weeks in preparation of the holiday, which is another weird thing. Put that aside for a second. Those broken tablets, if I was in charge, I would say, okay, let's hide these somewhere. It's kind of embarrassing. Let's put it in Geniza, like, you know, in those, you know, the Cairo Geniza where they put away old writings and just get it out of sight, out of mind. But no, those were actually placed in an arm. The Shivrei Luchos are placed in the Ark, in the Holy Ark. There's a special Ark, especially for the broken Luchos. That means there's something very significant about the fact that we had these tablets that were written with the finger of God and were destroyed. And we're keeping that. And what's the message? And the message is, and I think it's a very important message for all of us, and this is Maybe people can elucidate further. But to me, the message is, is that it's not about the end. It's about the journey. It's about the process of reaching unbelievable heights and falling from those heights and rebuilding again. That's what Shavuos really is all about. It's Yes, we got to such a high level, a level of prophecy, and then... We couldn't maintain it, and we fell to a very terrible depth. And But the recognition of what Shavuos is really about is the recognizing the process till you get to, the, to there. It's the process of the ups and downs. It's what life is all about, and that's really what the Torah is for, is to help us navigate the ups and downs in life. And that's what we need to recognize and appreciate, and that's why... Shavuos is very crucial to commemorate, even though we weren't able to maintain it, because that itself is really part and parcel of what it's, what it's all about. The ups and the downs and the difficulties. It's, if, you're, if you're only going to expect everything to be always on the up and up, you're going to be severely disappointed. And if you let the downs get to you too much without thinking, it's like, you know what, okay, it happens, we can always regroup. We can rebuild. We can start dig dig from that, that and build ourselves from that and learn from that. That's what it's really all about. So to me, that's like a very important, like central message that's clear from the holiday. So just sharing that with you. A beautiful idea that we we have the the tablets, the ones that endure the second set of tablets, but we can't forget about all the blunders that we had along the way because those also contributed towards the ultimate goal. It's like the uh, the famous verse that we have in scripture that says that the tzaddik falls down seven times and then, and then they get up. And that's not incidental to the ultimate result of the tzaddik. Actually, you're the product of all those ups and downs. And even those downs ultimately contribute towards what you're going to become. Seven times, seven weeks. Maybe that's why it's called shavuot. It's the process. So I have, I have a question. That's what, what, that's you, what, that was the idea, that it's, it's recognizing the process. Yeah. What do you call a person who falls 50 times, someone like me? Uh, even bigger <laughs> <So> time. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine. 
There's the something biggest, you fell even further. <laughs> <laughs> There's something I want to add on that, that to me it's like I don't have an answer. It's just something to think about. The revelation at Sinai was miraculous because to achieve a level of prophecy, I don't have experience in prophecy, but I've read enough about it. To achieve a level of prophecy, one has to refine his body to such a high degree. And it's nearly impossible for the average Joe okay, to actually develop his, refine his body to such a high degree that he's actually able to receive the prophecy. And yet we were able to. That was artificial in a sense. God brought us to a level that was higher than we could really achieve on our own. So in one sense, we were pushed up even higher than we really could be. On the other sense, in the opposite direction, the Talmud tells us that when it came to the sin of the golden calf, it says, Lo hoyu Yisrael ru'uyin lo samaisa. That, that, that was artificially low. It wasn't really, it was brought about, it was coordinated by God that we should actually fall to such a, a depth so as to encourage others that, well, if they were able to do tshuva from that, we can also come back from our mistakes and our flaws and what we do wrong. So it's very funny when you think about it. I don't have an answer or an un- insight. It's just the highs were artificially high and the lows were artificially low. We we're always really somewhere in the middle. But there, there's a purpose in pushing us beyond our real limits in the upper way and also falling deeper than our really we should have fallen as well to like rebound from that. And I think that's also... But isn't that the Jewish condition? We're, we're like the stars and like the sand, right? The, there's no mediocrity amongst our nation. One of the hallmarks of our people is that when we ascend, we're like the stars. That's what the Almighty tells our antecedents. We're like the stars, meaning that we're just absolutely towering above anything. We're, we're from a different universe, different stratosphere. But when we are low, we're, we're trodden over people's feet. I mean, we're below other people's feet, which is the lowest that you could get, and even lower. And, that, and that's kind of the polarity that we have, that uh, that's almost the condition. Like the Ramban says in this, in this passage's parasha, uh, parasha's, uh, well, this um, passage's parasha, but it's also featured elsewhere, that um, uh, the word uh, that's used for counting, counting the Jewish people, it's naso, count them. And the, the Ramban brings two, he brought quotes of Medrash, that brings two psukim, two verses that talk about Yisa, which is the same root as Naso. And that's what Joseph told his two cellmates. One, he told him, Pharaoh will decapitate you and remove your head. Yisas Rosh Chomel Rosh And one of them, he will ascend you. He will, he will promote you back to your previous stature. And that's the Jewish people. We're Naso. We're, we're going to be fulfilling this verb. Well, what does this verb mean? Either to me, we'll be uplifted will be ascended to this high level, will be like angels, will be the, the, the nation of God, the kingdom of priests, the holy nation, and will have a place of prominence close to the Almighty, or will be decapitated. But there's really no room in the middle. There's no gray area, and, that, and that's what we are as a nation. We, we don't have the option of, of, uh, of mediocrity and just being run of the mill and just, just, just being ignored. We're going to be great. Or we'll be absolutely famous, awful and dreadful. Famous or infamous. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so I love this. You're saying that that's what Shavuos is about, is, is it's commemorating or we're focusing on process change. So, that, you know, the Sefer Yitzira, ancient Kabbalistic text, says that there are three categories of Kedusha. It's all included in three things. Olam, Shana, and Nefesh, which is, Olam means world or place, space, and Shana is time, means year or time, and then Nefesh is the body. And holiness is, is manifest in one of these three ways. And the Kabbalists further say that the three festivals map out each one of these three, that Pesach corresponds to the nefesh, corresponds to the body, because it's the Chag HaMatzos, it's the festival that we're feeding the body. That's the, main, that's the main element of the holiday. That's what we're focusing on. Our service is eating, and we're very much engaged in the nefesh. And then Sukkot, on the other hand, is place. We have this place of holiness that we create and we reside in, and the Shechin, the Divine Presence, is there. And Shavuos corresponds to the holiday of time. And that's where time is manifest. But what, what is time? Right? Time is the measurement of change. As something develops and changes, that is as three-dimensional space changes over a limit. That's what the fourth dimension of time is. So that's really what Shavuos is. is this, it's the concept of change and development and process. It's beautiful. Dynamism. 
Well, great. Thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Nagel. That was fantastic. We uh, are, we've been edified. We've been uplifted as a result of that message. Rabbi Wolby. So to all of our listeners, thank you for joining us. And I wish everyone a beautiful Shavuos. Um, contrary to what many people believe, uh, they say, oh, it's a, it's a backdoor holiday. I've heard it referred to. It's like it, it doesn't get much uh, play in the Jewish calendar. And it's quite the opposite. It's the small, it's like the diamonds are so small, but they're so precious. Even though it's just a one day in Israel, two days here in the diaspora uh, holiday, it's a very, very precious holiday because it signifies our anniversary with the Almighty. And this is our celebration where we undertake again the relationship that we started 3,300 plus years ago. So to me, what's fascinating is that in my process of preparing this year for Shavuos, I found a gem here in the Sefer Toda'ah uh, by Rabbi Eliyahu Kitov, and he brings an actual text of the Ketubah that many congregations have a custom of reading when they take out the Torah on Shavuos, where they read an actual Ketubah between us and the Almighty. Marital yeah. contract, just to translate. What? The it's Ketubah ma- is the contract. Yeah, that's the marriage contract. Can, marital contract. That, that we, every groom gives his bride under the chuppah, this is the, the contract that we have with the Almighty. And, you know, many times we've heard this metaphor of, yeah, we're, we're sort of married to God. But the truth is, if you look at the words, na'asev and ishma, we will do and we will hear and we will listen. It's similar to a husband and wife. Because no man proposes to his wife uh, the marriage and... She says, well, I'll marry you if you can tell me what does this entail. Nobody says that. That, that, That's not not the way it works. We're like, yes, of course, I'm in. Now, what does it entail? We'll find out later what it's going to entail. And the Jewish people were the same thing in that when God said, do you want to be that nation, my chosen nation? They said, na'aseh. Kol asher diber Hashem na'aseh. We're in. What does it entail? We'll find out when it unfolds. And... In every relationship, when he gets down on that knee, she doesn't say, well, if there's illness, then I'm not interested. If there's poverty, I'm not interested. If there's this, if there's that, all of the preconditions. There's no such thing. It's we're all in. And the attitude that we have from Nasa and Ishma, from that time where the Jewish people said we're in, that's the same attitude we need to have now in our holiday of Shavuot. It's not, God forbid, a festival of cheesecake. It's not, oh, dairy. That's not the idea. It's that's letting go and, 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 and forgetting what the essence of the holiday is. The holiday is a time where we're celebrating our anniversary with the Almighty, where we said we're committing to this relationship through thick and thin. And yeah, we're going to be living in Houston, Texas, 3,300 years later, and there are going to be challenges, and there are going to be things that come up, and there are going to be things we didn't sign up for. And that's all part of that relationship. We don't throw out the relationship because there are difficulties. A marriage, hopefully, is not going to be cast aside because there is a change in, in the economy. There's a change with, with the, the financial situation, with the markets, with, oh, I didn't anticipate this, I'm out. No, it should make the relationship so much stronger. And my blessing to all of us here and all of our listeners is that we utilize this holiday as an opportunity to realize and recognize the connection that we ought to have with the Almighty in our being in this committed relationship that it elevates us, that we feel uplifted every single day of our lives and we should be be proud to be in this relationship, not to hide it, not to say, oh, I'm going on a business meeting to Vegas. Let me hide my yarmulke so nobody knows that I'm Jewish. On the contrary, we have to be proud of it. We wear that ring, right? A girl gets engaged, a young bride, we know they put that ring on their left, left uh, ring finger, and then they start driving only with that hand because they're so proud. They're showing off, look, I'm committed. I'm, I'm, I belong to someone, so to speak. I'm, my relationship is committed to this man. The same is with us. We shouldn't hide our relationship. We should keep that ring shining. We should keep that glowing so that the world can see and the world can take us as an example, hopefully, of what it means to be God's people. Thank you so much, Rabbi Wolby, uh, for the reminder that uh, Shavuos 
really is about this incredible relationship that we have that endures, that the, the passion endures 3,300 plus years later, and we renew our vows every year. How fortunate are we that we are the Almighty's people? What a wonderful message. Rabbi Bustro. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was, that was beautiful. It's always, it's, it's always important to remember to be proud to be a Jew. I mean, any, anything's an excuse to, to strengthen that. Beautiful. So com- coming back to the idea that Shavuos is about time, it's funny that it worked out like that because when did Shavuos occur? Everyone agrees it was on Shabbos. It took place on Shabbos. But at what time on the calendar, it was either the 6th of Sivan, according to the majority opinion, and the Talmud brings down, there's a dissenting opinion. Rabbi Yossi says that it was actually on the 7th of Sivan. But something very interesting is that it was supposed to be neither of those days, well, either on the 5th of Sivan or on the 6th of Sivan, respectively, according to those opinions. And what happened was Hashem, when he told Moshe, tell the Jewish people, prepare for this, get ready for receiving this incredible gift. He told Moshe that they need to prepare for two days. They need two days of preparation to get ready and, and uh, become proper vessels for this. And the Talmud tells us in, uh, in Shabbos, I think, Zion, Madal, 87, one, that Moshe, there are three times that Moshe on his own decided to, decided to make his own decision to put an enactment forward that wasn't given by God and God agreed. Those three things were one, he separated from his wife as, a, as the elevated prophet that he was. He determined that was necessary and Hashem agreed. He smashed the tablets that we spoke about earlier and Hashem agreed with that as well. He wasn't told to do that. He did it on his own. The third thing he did on his own was he added an extra day of preparation before the giving of the Torah. And Hashem agreed to that as well, as we see that the Torah was actually given one day later. So what, what's really interesting is uh, the Muggen of Ram, who is a, one of the most prominent halachic authorities of the last few hundred years, he quotes from the Kabbalists that this is a hint to the second day Yom Tov that happens in the diaspora. And so at first glance, it seems like because it really should have been on day one and it got pushed off and now it's on day two, but it doesn't really make sense because we don't celebrate the day one. It's, there's not even a theoretical day one. And then the day two becomes the day one and then there's a day two of the day two. If that makes sense what I'm saying, right? So how is this a hint to the second day Yom Tov that happens in the diaspora? So the Chassam Sofer says, uh, amazing. He says, first of all, Moshe did this. What was his reasoning? He was concerned that there might have been an expulsion of a seminal omission from a woman from previously when she had been with her husband. And Hashem wasn't concerned about that, but Moshe was. And the reason Hashem wasn't concerned about it is because we have a principle that let, let's say, for example, someone who does have a seminal mission, it does render a person impure to a certain degree, not a tremendous degree, but to a certain degree. The law is that he is not so impure that he can't learn Torah or say blessings or pray. He can. He's allowed to do all of these things. And the Talmud says the reason is the words of Torah do not receive impurity. And so because of that, it's allowed. What's strange about that statement is we're not talking about the words of Torah receiving impurity. We're talking about the person, the vessel for the Torah. Of course, the, I'll give you another example. If someone is impure in a, in a very significant way, he touches a, a dead animal or um, one of the other more serious levels of impurity, touches a, a dead person, and then tries to enter the temple, this is forbidden. It's not because he's going to infect the temple with impurity. The temple does not become impure, then we now have to fix everything. He didn't affect anything. The problem is him. He is an improper vessel. He is distorted, and he can't be in this place of sanctity when he's in that state. And so the issue of a person being impure is not be. Well, it's not a problem to learn Torah because words of Torah don't receive impurity. It's not about the Torah. It's about him. He's the vessel. So the answer is like this. When the Torah was given, Moshe was concerned. Hashem wasn't concerned because the vessel, what is the vessel for the Torah? What's the Torah for? 
it is not for the body. It's not meant for our lives here in this worldly world. It's meant for chaye olam habo, life, eternal life in the world to come. It empowers the soul. It feeds the neshama directly. It's what the neshama eats, so to speak. It is Torah. And so therefore, there's no, there's no concern that there's going to be something wrong with the body because the Torah has nothing to do with the body. It bypasses it completely and interacts with the true recipient, which is the neshama. So Hashem's not concerned with whatever. Give the people the Torah, it goes directly to them. But Moshe was concerned about the body because in order to fully engage in the Torah with your soul, that requires a high level of sincerity. That means learning Torah lishma for its own sake. I'm engaging with this Torah with my soul, with no ulterior motives, with no, maybe I'll get rich from it, maybe I'll, you know, people will respect me more. If I can do it purely for the best intentions, then it interacts directly with my soul and bypasses the body. The problem is we're not all there. Sometimes we lower ourselves. Sometimes we're not feeling it. And sometimes we degrade ourselves to a point that we're incapable of engaging on that level. And at that point, it seems like maybe it's disingenuous to learn Torah. Because if I'm not doing it with the utmost sincerity, what's the point? But our sages instruct us that even if it's for ulterior motives, in any situation, just jump in. Person, engage yourself. It doesn't say learn. It says engage yourself. Just do it. Put yourself in the place of Torah study and mitzvahs, even if it's for ulterior motives, because from there at least you get the training and then you can move to a more significant uh, motivation. So a woman in my neighborhood yesterday told me that she was listening to a podcast who said that she doesn't tell her kids to say please or thank you or sorry or anything like that because she wants it to be genuine. She wants the kid to actually mean it, so she's not going to tell the kid to say it. Like, <laughs> good luck. Good luck. That's, I, I can't think of anything more foolish. Teach your kid what to say. Train the kid. Of course, he's not gonna, it's not going to be serious. It's not going to be genuine. He's a child. He doesn't have the wherewithal to mean it genuinely, but at least you give the kid the training. And once it's there, you've built an infrastructure and then you pour in all the sincerity when it becomes real. So yeah, I'm calling her out foolish. It was a foolish statement. We need to train ourselves. Now, Moshe saw this coming. Ideally, this never would have been necessary. When the Torah was given to the Jewish people, it would have gone directly into our souls and we'd have interacted on that level. But Moshe saw into the future, so to speak. He he predicted we might not always be on that level and we might fall prey to sin and we might degrade ourselves to the point where we'll need our bodies. And so therefore he set a precedent. Give us an extra day of preparation to purify the body. Let the body get involved here because we need the Torah to be accessible on every level, even when we're not feeling it. Without that, we wouldn't have had an option. And so the Kabbalists say this was a hint to the second day of Yom Tov in the diaspora, because the reason we have a second day in diaspora is because of the destruction of the temple, because of our sin, because we've degraded ourselves. Moshe saw this coming. He gave us a chance. And the message is, if you're not feeling it, who cares? Train yourself. Get into it, and you will get there. Thank you so much, Rabbi Busto, for that uh, very, uh, very clever insight. But I want to push back, or at least hear more about what you have to say about this, uh, because... I was always trained that the objective of Torah is that it actually influence, elevates, transforms the body. We don't believe that the body must necessarily be uh, in opposition to the agenda of the Almighty. We don't believe that. We believe that it too can be brought up to parity with the soul. It could be elevated. It could be refined. And that's why, like the Gemara says, the, the, the bodies of the tzaddikim don't confer impurity because they themselves have cleansed and refined and elevated their bodies. So, and the mitzvahs, of course, mitzvahs we do with our bodies almost exclusively. So the objective is not to say, well, there's the, the way I understand it. Uh, maybe you can clarify 
But it's not to say, well, we have the soul and the soul is pure and elevated and refined and sublime and all that. And the body, well, it's a vessel of sin and, and, and it's kind of left behind. Rather, it's to create a certain parity, a certain harmony, a balance between the body and the soul. And the body and soul are both rowing in the same direction. The body is also undertaking the agenda of the soul via it being transformed with Torah. Well, that's the, that, that's, that's the, the magic of, of, a, of a tzaddik where they become in their entirety completely subservient and sub- submitted to God, and that's done via Torah. So maybe you could clarify yeah, more about that. I, w- I will clarify. Yeah. Let, let's say you're driving somewhere, you don't know where you're going, and someone gives you directions. So are the directions that they give you for the car or for you? They're for you. I mean, the car is the one that's going to have to employ. The car is the thing that gets you there. The car is the vessel. But the directions aren't for the car. It's for the driver of the car. It's for you. It's for you to be able to get to your destination. The Torah is, it does have the capacity to transform the body, but it's not for the body. It's for the soul. Uh, okay, and so we're going to disagree on this because... Uh, we, know, we know that the, the reason we have the resurrection, the Tchias HaMesim, is because it's not fear for just the soul to get the reward. Because the body participated. Because the body and, participated. And was elevated. But, but, but the idea that. that there would even be a question about that is what Rabbi Bosco is saying. Meaning, no, but in your analogy, okay, the, the, the soul is the driver, the body is the car, right? We believe that the car doesn't remain a car. You do a mitzvah, the body is now elevated. The body is more refined. The body becomes more pure. It becomes more soul-like. The Ramchal talks about this all yeah, the time, right? Is the, is the, the body itself can become more like an neshama, more like a soul with the mitzvahs. It doesn't remain a car. It doesn't remain a donkey. It doesn't remain like that. It too becomes transformed. And that's what the tzaddik has to do. It has to transform all the physicality and render it now spiritual as well and create a certain parity between this world and uh, the world of the heavens, right? the world of God, so to speak, to bring God into this world and to take this world, this mundane and what could be corrupted world and a world that is ready for sin and ready for corruption and ready for heresy, to take this world and make the Almighty, so to speak, even in this world, make him manifest that even the body. This is a worthy that. debate, and I think it might even be an ancient debate. But the, the principle that we're arguing about is this. Is the goal to elevate the body or is the goal... Or, I would say yes. Or is the goal... <laughs> to get the soul to a place where it wouldn't be able to reach without the body. Because the soul by itself is in the presence of God, and there's no opportunity for free will for it to be able to elevate. Being in the physical world, in this avatar called the body, gives it opportunities to become elevated. And so therefore, the body plays an instrumental role Literally an instrument. But the body world. itself is also transformed. It is, but that's and not the, the goal. And the are directed at uh, creating a certain parity from the body and the soul. But the body is also facilitatory. I agree. It's only for the sake of the soul. The body, 100%. of course, becomes transformed. 100%. But it's all for 100%. the soul. Yeah, so it, it, you, you are correct that it might be an ancient uh, debate because there is a debate as to whether or not we have bodies in Olam Abba. A very, very. Um, it's debated if that's a debate. Strident, as well. It's a very strident debate amongst the medieval commentators. Do you have a body in Olam Abba? The Gemara seems to imply, right, the Gemara that uh, Rabbi Wolby referenced, that the that resurrection is the merging of the body and the soul once again. So the body is participatory in Olam Abba. Uh, the Ramam apparently says not like that. If you, and there, there's there very, com- very voluminous literature about this debate. There are many commentators on the Rambam that say that. Of course, he didn't mean that. So it's debated if it's even a debate as well. So many debates within the Jewish people. This is great. This is a shavu. This is all about. <laughs> well, very, very interesting. Um, well, I, I think this is there's certainly dimensions. Well, we believe that ultimately, ultimately, our identity is the soul, and that's the that's the objective. And you know, the soul's here for a temporary time, and the soul outlasts the body. And the body is always changing. Dan has a great insight. Dan, you remember your insight? Do you remember well, about the body always changing? Oh yes. Dan had a brilliant genius because every seven years, every seven years, all the souls and cells in your body are regenerated and there's a, your new body. Go ahead. Say your, say your idea. I've well, said, I, I quoted I just, you the body. I just sort of like uh, synced up when you were talking about the laws of uh, Shemitah and the seven years. Yeah, your, money, your, 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 your debts are annulled every seven years because there, there's not a single cell that you have that's the, that's the same cell. That was that gave, that, that gave the, the, the loan uh, seven years prior. So every seven years, it's a complete refresh of the body. But the body is very dynamic, and the soul has a certain degree of, 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 of static nature to it because that's who you actually are. And that 
preceded the body and it will outlive the body. And so, yeah, well, certainly that's true. But uh, the, we see many, many, many sources of the effect of the objective or uh, certainly an element of our mythos and our life here is oriented and directed at the body and elevating the body and the body and soul should both be working in tandem towards uh, achieving the objective of the soul. And the, the, well, the point of what I was saying and to tie it back to that analogy with the car is instead of giving, what if you're not interested in getting to the destination, right? Well, let, let's say you're incapacitated, at least plug the coordinates into the GPS. Maybe the car, the Tesla will drive you there itself. And then you get there, right? That's the idea of engage the body in Torah. It'll bring you there eventually, even if you're not uh, as engaged. I'm okay with that. To be continued. <laughs> Maybe next time we'll debate it out. Thank you so much, Rabbi Buster. That was wonderful. Uh, Dan? Wow, it's, it's humbling to be sitting here at the table with all these amazing rabbis at scholarship, and then we get to meet. So I'm just going to share with you what I've been contemplating and thinking about. This year, I did have enough foresight to realize that I wanted to prepare this year for Shavuos. I wanted to, especially sitting around with these rabbis, like I would love to be in a position to really get more Torah like they have. So I started reviewing my year a few weeks prior to Pesach. And just looking at the challenges I had the prior year, what I could learn from that. And so I would sort of know what to focus on in the, as I led into Shavuos and through the year. And as I was reviewing my challenges first, one of the things that came up, of course, was things that I discussed with Robert Ari Wolby in an unplanned podcast. I just asked him for a little you know, normal Rabbi Ari therapy session before we did a podcast and I hit the report record button. And I'm thankful I did because I got the most positive feedback from that podcast. But he explained, I was talking about this, the struggles of learning Torah and the challenges with it. And he pointed out what now is clearly obvious is that that's, that's the idea. It's like, you don't go to the gym and say, I don't want to struggle. Like that's the whole idea is that you want to struggle with it. So I told myself this year, I was like, Thank God I struggled. Hopefully next year I look back and say I struggled once again. So I took those challenges, set them off to the side, and I started looking at all the other challenges I had had that previous year. And what I learned was quite horrifying. What I realized is that I didn't have any challenges. There were no challenges. They were all fabrications. They were all created in my mind because of arrogance. You remove the arrogance, there's no problems there. Which that was horrifying because this whole idea of having humility, which is the essential ingredient to receive Torah, to empty out that arrogance so there's a vessel to receive Torah, was, was very disheartening to see like I had not made any progress in this area. It's something... Two years prior, I had set out to do. I knew I had an issue with this. The, the reason I knew I had an issue with this, I'll tell you the story, is that I had called and left a message for Rabbi Jacobian to discuss an idea about doing a podcast. And I had found out something that day. So when he called me back, I was excited to tell him this. What I had found out was, is that what we already had known is that before I moved to this community, I had learned that my great-grandmother was not Jewish. She was adopted. And there's this big question mark, you know, am I Jewish? Am I not Jewish? We didn't know what to do with it, but I had found out that day that it was my mother's great, great grandmother. It was an adoption that took place in the 1850s. So the concern, you know, this is many years before, you know, these ideas of Jewish denominations, Reform Judaism came imported to the United States. The idea of you know, where people started coming up with their own ideas for conversion, so there was not a concern there. So I was very excited. I told Rabbi Jacobian, you know, this is great. I don't think there's, there's not an issue here. And he said to me, Dan, I've always known with 100% certainty that you're Jewish. And that's why I said you could go ahead and count as a minion. And I said, so how in the world would you possibly know that without this very important intel I just shared with you? And he said to me, the reason I knew you, you were Jewish with absolute certainty is because every time I asked you to do something, 
you argued with me. And as I was about to start arguing with them about how I never argue with them, I stopped myself. And for those listening, it's like, what does that mean? I think the idea here is that Jews have much stronger yetzer hurrahs to create a counterbalance weight with the, the, the stature of the neshamas that we come from in order to keep things equal. So I guess when non-Jews go to the base den and say, I like to convert, and the rabbis say, well, do X, they say, of course, rabbi, and they do X. You get a Jew and Dan Coleman, and the rabbis say, do X, like, I don't know. I don't know if I really agree with that. Maybe I should do Y. So I understood where he was coming from. But, so, but I, I really started thinking about then Rabbi Jacobian and something that he had said. I really started contemplating this idea. So during this process, I'd always meet with him to sort of go over the halakha I learned and you know just sort of have him test and see where I was holding and, and provide me some guidance. And one time early on, he said, Dan, let's step back. I want you to tell me why do we do this particular mitzvah? And I stopped for a second, got my thoughts together, and I gave this amazing, well-thought-out expose on why we do this mitzvah. And when I was done, I knew I was going to look up and I was going to see Rabbi Yacobian grinning ear to ear and say, Dan, that was beautiful. You are such a sodic. You're amazing. But what I looked up and saw was a man who had a look of just irritation in his face. And he slaps his hand on the table and says, no, we do that mitzvah because Hashem said so. And you would think that would happen one time. I think that happened five or six times. <laughs> <laughs> and I was really contemplating like the beauty of what he was saying. And in the depth of that statement is the, the solution to what I was looking for. Because I'd always been contemplating like the psychological construct of the mind and, and how to build in humility in all these things. And what he was saying was just so pure, and it actually is the solution to achieving humility. So I, I shared this idea at my Pesach table that first night, and I, I told them about like we had this Torah before Mount Sinai. You know, it was, you know, like Rabbi Busco referenced, we have this Sefer Yetzirah that uh, Av put together. We know that Shem had a, a yeshiva. What was it they were learning? It was these ideas like with uh, Sefer Yetzirah where you can extend your consciousness, you know, to different levels, like in this other world, and you can manipulate the Hebrew letters. And then, you know, like the, the sages would use this, this technology to create calves before Shabbos. And I was sort of talking about how, you know, Avraham knew all the mitzvot because he was able to, he was at such a lofty level, he knew that it made sense to wave a lulav, you know, at a certain time of the year. But then I said, let's look at the tour we got post Mount Sinai. And I said, here's an example of that. My wife, Ellie Sheva, spent the last week scrubbing out the pantry and the fridge, getting rid of all the crumbs, and then getting rid of all the hummets, and then you know, supervising me, koshering the kitchen, and then, you know, getting food, kosher food, cooking, all this stuff that on the outside looks like very mon mundane. It's not, as, it's not as cool sounding as elevating your consciousness to the world of uh, another realm and creating a calf. But I said, like, but that's the beauty of it, is because even though those mundane acts make no sense, what she was saying is, Hashem said so. I am fulfilling his will. I have limited intellect compared to my creator. When we do these mitzvot, or even studying Torah, and we don't understand why we're doing it, that's the beauty. We're removing that intellect our, that doesn't understand our arrogance and just fulfilling the Almighty's will. And, and that is the beauty of what he gave us, is the ability through those actions to humble ourselves. And the more we do that, the more we humble ourselves, even just learning Torah. Sometimes you're learning Torah. It doesn't, like, why am I learning this? Like, I was just studying in Mishnah Barua about the halakha around, if it's Shabbos, I'm super thirsty. When you find gentlemen, invite me over for your home for Shabbos or someone else, and I get served a glass of muddy water with worms all floating through it, right? And I was studying, like, I don't think this is ever going to happen. But I was thinking to myself, Rabbi Jacobian's words, why am I learning this? Because Hashem said so. 
So I think that is the beauty of what the Almighty gave us. That's what the Jews were thinking of when they stood at Mount Sinai and they said, we will do what we'll hear. It's simply that subservience. And one more quick idea I want to share to put a punctuation mark on, and you guys can cut this out if I'm going too long, taking up too much self space. But some things that Rabbi Ari said through an experience I had as he was talking just now about being proud. He talked about our last podcast, being proud to be a Jew. And he talked in the past about, you know, why the other nations, you know, sort of resent us at times and about how, you know, there was anti Semitism that, that came into the world uh, when we received the Torah. And here's this experience. So I hired a gentleman recently back late last year, awesome guy. And I first went out to go travel with him in his local area in Arizona. And I explained to him, I was like, look, I, I keep kosher. So I can't eat at these restaurants with you. So, you know, I explained the whole deal. So we go out and we do our travels together. And that night he says, well, what are you doing for dinner? And I was like, I got some, you know, tuna fish wraps playing in the hotel room. He's like, no, I insist. Let me take you out to a kosher restaurant. It's like, I don't want to put you out. They're like 25 minutes, or, you know, drive from here. We went to a kosher restaurant. He was asking all types of questions. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? I explained everything to him. Two weeks ago, we go out and travel again. And we're in LA and we're with another advisor. And, the, and he explains to the other advisor, Dan won't be eating with this because he's not a Jack Jew. And the other guy said, oh, okay. And I was like, what do you mean, okay? What does that mean? <laughs> I was like, you know, I work out. I'm sort of Jack Jew. And he's like, no, no, no. You never heard the word Jack Mormon? Have you rabbis heard this term? No. Oh. Okay. So not Jack, practicing? A Jack Mormon <laughs> is what Mormons call a Mormon who's not following their laws. So he was explaining this term that Dan's not a Jack Jew. He does what he's supposed to do. And the other guy said, like, I really admire that. But here's what I realized in the conversation is that as they were sort of catching up with each other, the gentleman used a few words of profanity. And he turned to me and he said, I am so sorry. Please forgive me. And I'm thinking, like, why, why are you apologizing to me? And then I realized, like, oh, he's looking at me with a yarmulke, keeping kosher. I now represent something pretty big. And as he was apologizing, he said, no, 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 I need to step up my game. I'm thinking to myself, I got to step up my game because the rest of the world's looking at me now expecting something much greater. But here's another really cool thing that happened right after that. We were driving to, to uh, the next appointment and my friend says to me, Dan, I really love going to that kosher restaurant. So I realized I have a really good friend of mine who's Jewish. He has a Jewish deli and I really wanted to go eat at it. So I went to this restaurant, I ordered the food and I realized this isn't right. So he calls his friend up and says, hey, I'm at your restaurant. Are you here? And the guy's like, yeah. He's like, come on, we got, we got to talk. He said, friends, his friend comes out and he says, I don't understand. This is a Jewish deli, right? And the guy says, yeah. He's like, well, you got dairy and meat here. You can't do that. This isn't kosher. And the guy's like, I know I, I don't do that. He's like, is this meat even kosher? You know, the cow has to be killed in a very certain way and be inspected. And his friends like explains like no look man I don't do all that he's like he's like well if you're not keeping kosher why do you have Jewish deli out front and he was telling me it's like I was just so frustrated I don't know why you know it just really bothered me he goes did I do the wrong thing and I said do you love your Jewish friend he's like yeah I love the guy I was like you did absolutely the right thing <laughs> and it's just this whole idea guys it's like you know the other nations. They know inside, deep inside in their, their soul, like the world's going to be such an amazing place when we, the Jewish people, keep the Torah. And so the idea I'm, I'm sort of going to wrap this up with is that as we get to Shavuos, it's not only Hashem, it's the whole world is pleading with us to say, I will do and I will hear. Thank you so much, Dan. That was absolutely epic. And uh, I think Rabbi Akobin would say about your friend that he's he's probably not Jewish, right? No, he's yeah. not. He tips everything as it's, though, as it's told. <laughs> I, I want to just uh, add one more thing to what you said uh, because we spoke about the you spoke about the Torah before Sinai, and uh, and the Sefer Yitzira, and uh, this mystical book about uh, about uh, combining the letters that God used to yeah. the world, and Abraham wrote that. It's important for us to acknowledge the following point: Abraham himself. 
he didn't subsist with that Torah alone. It wasn't just in, in the stars. You know, Abraham is one of the few people that are called a Evet Hashem, a servant of Hashem. Abraham's whole life was subservience to Hashem as well. Uh, and all of his tests were a display of his complete fidelity to God and subservience to God. And when God said stuff that he disagreed with, he accepted. Like, um, And God told him to do things that he didn't agree with and he just did them. And God told him to violate his own innate uh, kindness and he violated it. So so it, it, oh, I'm not I'm not contesting your point and I'm acknowledging your point but certainly when it comes to when it comes to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob they, they these were absolute titans uh, pillars of the world and they were certainly a uh, subservient uh, to God in 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 any in way that we could possibly even aspire to to be. But, but the idea though is the way I sort of see it is that they were able especially Abraham to achieve such a tremendous amount of humility in order to make that connection in order to fill the Almighty's will, in order to achieve that prophecy. It seems like because of their merit, now we have sort of the technology of Torah that we can achieve that level of humility just by fulfilling yes. each mitzvah. And in general, everything that we have is thanks to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We start our prayer. We say, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that's our claim. Like, we could come before God only because of that. We are very much indebted S- to Serious them. name dropping. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I call it the... Uh, Do you know who I am? <laughs> I call it the uh, thank you for allowing nepotism to exist in your creation. Yes. Yes. And we are their descendants, and that's the only reason why we survived anything, the only reason why we left Egypt, the only reason why we got the Torah, and we... Everything, the mitzvahs, everything that we have and we endured until now, it's all thanks to the covenants that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob forged with God and because of their own greatness. We, we don't just happen to be descended from them. We're part of them. Right. We have their qualities uh, coursing within us. Yeah. Uh, okay. So if, uh, probably no one's listening anymore because I always go at the end. So whatever. I'll just, I'll talk to y'all. If there's still by any chance there's still someone listening, listening. maybe the – okay, good. Um so I want to talk a little bit about what the Gemara says about this festival. The Gemara talks about uh, this festival in a very unique way, uh, maybe apropos to what we spoke about earlier. Uh, the Gemara says that there, there's a discussion, you know, how much on festivals and Shabbos are we supposed to celebrate as a body and how much as a soul? And the Gemara says a very interesting statement about Shavuos, Atzeres, as it's called on the Gemara. Everyone agrees that on the festival of Shavuos, you also have to engage the body. The, the body is also part of this celebration. Maybe other days not, but certainly on Shavuos, yes. There's something about our physicality uh, that we celebrate. The Gemara gives a, a story about this. The Gemara says about Rabbi Yosef, who's one of the sages of the Talmud, he would make an incredible feast on Shavuos, and he would take a fattened calf, and he would say, what a great day this is. If not for this day, I would be nothing. There's a lot of people named Yossi, in the shuk, in the in the marketplace, you go to the marketplace full of average shows, full of average shows. But on this day, we 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 got the Torah, and we we got the capacity to study the Almighty's Torah. And on this day, we're able to be elevated. And as a result of that, we have to celebrate with the feast of of Shavuos. So it's an interesting thing that Gemara tells us, certainly the way Rashi interprets it, that this is the day that we achieve the capacity of becoming super, of becoming extraordinary, of being elevated, of being uh, trans, transposed and transformed into a different level of, of a human. There's a lot of people in the world, but there are certain people that are towering above others. They're almost like a different species. That's what Rabbi Yossi is saying. It's like, there's a lot of people with my name, but I was elevated to a level above others because I, I studied Torah. And this reminded me of, of the Sefer HaChinuch. The Sefer HaChinuch is an incredible uh, book uh, written in the medieval uh, era by uh, unauth- unknown authorship, or it's, it's a question who wrote it, it's not clear, but in the introduction, it's an incredible introduction uh, to the book. And one of the questions that he asks is, if the Torah is so wonderful, why was it not given to everyone? You know, we have the Torah, it's for us and not for everyone else. Why not? So what he says is a very powerful idea, and I'll, I'll couch it in uh, 21st century terms. Today... It's very rare to see someone who can run a four-minute mile. A couple hundred people in history have done it. It's very rare. Much less a sub 10-second 100-meter dash. How many people could be astronauts? How many people have actually uh, graced the moon? Not getting into the discussion of whether or not it actually happened, but how many astronauts are there? Like, How many Navy SEALs are there? Like, they, they, There are certain elites you know, the, the, the 1% of 1% of, of humanity in every field. In the field 
of being elevated, in the field of being connected to the Almighty on a level that no other human can, in the field, as the, the, the verse tells us, of being a kingdom of peace and holy nation, we are the Navy SEALs. We are that elite in the one area of connection with the Almighty. And when did we get that? When did we get this capacity of, of ascending and becoming so uh, so spiritual, so spiritually acute and, and, and refining ourselves to the degree that we can become indistinguishable from angels? When did that happen? It happened on Shavuos. And that's what we're celebrating on this day, this, this ability of, of, of elevation and transformation and, and being part of this incredibly unique group of people, this unique cohort of people. Of course, we know the Midrash tells us that the Almighty offered the Torah to everyone. He went to the Ishmaelites and Esau and the Romans and the Persians. Everyone had the opportunity and they all passed. And we accepted and that gave us this portal to greatness that we have, uh, we have via the Torah. Now, I saw another idea along these lines, a courtesy of the great Rabbi Shlomo Arieli, who was the, the, the famous Talmudic lecturer by Usher Arieli's brother. And uh, he has a book that I purchased, and I got it last week, and I was perusing it. Uh, and he, it's on the festivals, and he has a nice piece on Shavuos, and he speaks about this Gemara. And he says something very interesting that I think it's worthy to share. Torah is a pursuit. It's our national pastime. It's what makes us Jewish. There's a famous line, I think it's from Sa'ad Yadron, that says that our nation is differentiated only by the fact that we have the Torah. That's our pastime. That's our obsession. That's who we are. That's what we represent. But there are other pursuits as well. People are into mathematics or history or whatever pursuit uh, that they, they may have. There are other pursuits and, there, and there's Torah. But Torah is qualitatively different in that Torah transforms the person. You think about a person, they have knowledge, right? You are you and, and you have knowledge. And that knowledge is appendage to you, so to speak, but you remain the same. And that's why you have someone who is an ethicist who is not very ethical in their behavior because, you know, there's the field of study and then there's who, who you are. And those are, are separate. You could be a very ethical person, but that's <laughs> that's a separate discussion. It's a separate uh, pursuit to actually become an ethical person. Torah is different. When you immerse yourself in the Mayas Torah, necessarily you're going to be elevated. And that's what Rashi, Rashi even says on Rabbi Yossi. says that this is the day that changed everything because we got the Mayas Torah. And, and part of that is that we were elevated to a, to a higher level. And an example of that is uh, what we spoke about earlier. The, the, the broken, uh, Rabbi Nagel mentioned the broken tablets, the shards of the tablets. What happened to those shards of the tablets? They were placed in the ark. And in the ark, you had the luchos and the shiver luchos, the, the, the tablets that were not shattered, that endured, and the ones that were shattered, shattered. And the Gemara says, why? Why do you have the luchos and the shiver luchos? Why do you have the, the tablets that were unbroken and the ones that are broken in the ark? It's to tell you that the Torah scholar who forgot all of his Torah is still in the ark. You have the Torah scholar that has, it's pristine, nothing's lost, perfect, like the unbroken tablets. And they're in the ark. And you know who's right next to them? The Torah scholar that's completely shattered. You forget all your Torah? You're right there. You're still there. Why are you still there? Because you still have that elevation. That transformation endures. Even if the Torah is forgotten, the letters have flown back to heaven, the status that a person absorbs with their transformation, that remains. If someone is a great physicist, but then they lose every bit of knowledge of physics that they have and they're like a first grader when it comes to physics, they're not a great physicist anymore. Because again, the knowledge is separate from the person. With Torah, persons refined and elevated to such a degree, they could forget everything and they could still be right there alongside the other Torah scholar. They're both in the ark and they're completely uh, indistinguishable. Our sages tell us that the fools, the fools... They stand up when their Torah scroll comes in, but when a, a Torah sage comes in, they don't. The Gemara tells the great sages compare themselves to, to veritable Torah scrolls. And this maybe is uh, relevant to our discussion that we had, uh, Rabbi Vasco and I, that a person gets completely changed, body and soul, together. And what's amazing about this is that who was Rabbi Yossi, the author of this statement? Who was he? Who was he? He was one of the great sages of the Talmud. But he had a little bit of a tragic story in his life. He became blind and he forgot all of his Torah. So if you just measured him 
the way he is right now, the knowledge that he has, he doesn't have knowledge that would be sufficient to be considered a, a Torah sage. But nevertheless, he was transformed, he was elevated. And that's why he's the one to tell us this idea. He's the one to celebrate the transformation that we have or the, the, the great gift that we have on Shavuos, that we have the ability to have a, a, a study, a pursuit that's completely transformational to a person. And Rabbi Yossi is still one of the great sages because he had a Torah and that uh, remains forever, that sticks around. So I think it's just a nice thing to appreciate that we have the capacity to connect to the Almighty in a way that no one else has. This is how we love God. This is how we fear God. This is how we interface with God. He gave us his Torah. And the holiness that's found in the Torah is the holiness of God. And that's how we can, we can have a relationship with the Almighty via his Torah. And that's what we're celebrating. On this day, the Almighty tells us, I'm going to give you what you need to be the kingdom of peace and the holiness, to be that elite, those Navy seals of humanity. This is what we got. And we still have it. And the holiness of the Torah has not been diminished. And the letters of the Torah are the same letters that the Almighty used to create the world. The same letters that the Rabban tells us are the names of God. We still have the Torah in its complete, pristine holiness. What a privilege that we have to be part of this great nation and to be able to immerse ourselves in the Almighty, in the Almighty's holy Torah. And this, of course, we're going to revisit on Shavuos, and hopefully we will be endowed with the blessing of Torah and to have an incredible, uplifting year in all of our pursuits of greatness and growth, and of course, in our pursuit of Torah. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us here at the Torch Center. Uh, Rabbi, rabbis, uh, respectively, Rabbi Nagel, Rabbi Wolby, Rabbi Busto, Dan, who, didn't we, uh, didn't we give you a smicha last, last time? No, God help us, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was wonderful. Uh, you could uh, reach out uh, to any one of us on our respective uh, emails, uh, Rabbi Nagel at uh, gmail.com, is that right? A. Wolby at uh, torchweb.org. Rabbi Busto has like seven different email addresses. Yeah, you just pick one of them. <laughs> Any one of them. The average rabbi. At, at torchweb.org? Web.org. And uh, Dan still has El Presidente at torchweb.org. My email address is rabbiwalbajima.com. Everyone have a wonderful, uplifting Shavuos. And please, God, we'll get together again uh, for the next festival. We had a little bit of a discussion before we recorded whether we should do Tisha B'Av or not. Maybe we'll do Tisha B'Av, which is a, a sad festival. It's a festival, but it's a sad festival. Maybe we'll see, but... Uh, Send us uh, some feedback, some commentary. Of course, visit our website, torchweb.org. If you want to support the great work of Torch, we appreciate it. We need it. We appreciate all the support and, of course, your listenership. Until next time from the Torch Center, this was wonderful, and I deeply appreciate your time and your listenership and your friendship and your support. Have a great Yanta. Bonus content. We, we can end it there. But if, <laughs> if you want to keep this in, then maybe we can have this as bonus content. I love it. You, you mentioned Rabiosi. You said that Rabiosi forgot all his Torah. Maybe you're. Rabiosef. Maybe I'm mistaken. It's Rav Yosef. It's the same Rav Yosef. Yosef. It's really Rav Yosef who called him by his nickname, himself by his nickname, Yossi. Oh, very good. Well, you want to hear something awesome on that Gemara that you quoted from the Sam Sofer? It's actually related to the word that I said. That's about Sam Sofer. He says, Rav Yosef says, if not for this day, then, you know, Kami Yosef have the shuk. There's a lot of, you know, average Joes in the marketplace. So the thing is, he was blind, right? When you're blind, you can't read the Torah. Now, there's a, con there's a requirement that if you're going to be studying the Torah and, and uh, disseminating it in public, you have to be able to read the words from the text with your eyes in order to say it out loud. So he wasn't able to do that. So instead, he used the... Aramaic translation, the Targum. Now, it's brought down that that Targum, that trans translation that we have, with the destruction of the temple, and with the lowering of the Jewish people, that translation became semi-infused with holiness as sort of a semi-status of the Torah itself. And that only happened as a result of the breaking of the tablets and the destruction of the temple and the sin and having to relegate ourselves to a lower level Torah. And all of that, the fact that the Torah is still accessible, the fact that it is able to downgrade together with us and remain accessible is all as a result of the fact that Moshe had pushed off an extra day to give us that extra day of preparation and clarity. So Rav Yosef was saying, if not for 
the fact that Shavuos is this day as opposed to yesterday, wow. then I would be irrelevant because I wouldn't be able to continue studying Torah. That's beautiful. And, it's because and it fits also with what Rabbi Nagel said, mm, that yes. the failures are actually to our benefit. You know, the, the, the broken, broken tablets and, uh, and, and, you know, and the fact that the, the, it didn't quite work out as planned, that too is infused with holiness. And uh, that's what we're celebrating. Oh, that's what Rabbi is celebrating. But all of us with our, uh, you know, the, the broken shards of our life, so to speak, that too uh, uh, is something that we can uh, note and acknowledge and celebrate on Shavuos. Well, I, the bonus content. I love it. I love it. All right. Okay. Oh, signing Use off. It. Goodbye. <laughs>